everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So I'm trying to, to be half as good as it was with Rust before. So there is a full room with people. So I'll try my best, but of course I cannot be as good as him. Anyway, we are going to talk about a much practical topic, which is universal JavaScript. And um, I'm going to show you actually how to build a very little and simple application. But with this application, we are going to learn some of the fundamental concepts behind universal JavaScript. So if you want to know who is Luciano, you can follow me on GitHub, on uh, Twitter, and I also have a blog. And I am a full stack engineer. I work for Planet Nine Energy in Dublin. Planet Nine is a company that is building a trading platform for the energy market in UK. So we work a lot with big data, but also we do a lot of cool things with serverless. So if you are interested in this kind of topics, we can talk after. I am also the co-writer of Node.js Design Pattern. Uh, Mario Casciaro is the original author, and we worked together on the second edition. I had a very nice discount from Packet Publishing, if you are interested in buying the book. So that codes are for you here at CodeMotion. I am also the founder of Fullstack Bulletin, which is a newsletter for Fullstack developers. I just launched it with Andrea Mangono two weeks ago. The widget should be the sign up form that you can see online if you see the presentation. but. Uh, Apparently, I am offline. Anyway, fullstackbulletin.com if you are interested in keeping up with full stack related content. So, going to our agenda today, we are going to talk about what does it mean when we say universal JavaScript, which companies are, are already using it and why, then what are the common problems as soon as you start to implement universal JavaScript in your application, and which ones are the technologies that you can already use to achieve this goal. And then we are going to actually build, I'm going to show you some code, how to build a very simple uh, single page application. And then after that, we are going to transform it into a universal JavaScript application. So starting from the term universal JavaScript, probably you already heard before about isomorphic. And then it was universal, basically, the two words describe the same thing. If you want to read the full story, there is a link there with all the discussion in the community. Should we call it isomorphic? Should we call it universal? We all know all these things happen in, uh, in IT. But anyway, the, the gist of it is that universal JavaScript means that um, we know that JavaScript was born as a language in the browser. But as soon as we had Node.js, we started to use JavaScript also on the backend. And since then, there was this kind of little dream of every developer that, oh, maybe I can share most of my code from the browser to the server and back from the server to the browser. That's exactly what universal JavaScript means. It's trying to reduce the duplication of code between the backend and the frontend. And there are a number of tricks and techniques that we need to learn in order to achieve that. But as soon as you do it, the advantage is clear. And I'm going to say that as soon as you do that, you can start to think also about, oh, maybe I can also write desktop application with this paradigm. And we know there are a number of tools like Electron that allows you to do that. Or maybe I can start to write mobile application with the same paradigm. And we know there is React Native and other uh, frameworks that allows you to do, that, to do that. And there are even crazy people that start to write software to control hardware in JavaScript. So what are the advantages? So the first advantage for me is that you start to think in JavaScript only. So you lose the, the effort of, of constantly switching language. Uh, as a consequence of this, your code might be much more maintainable because in your team, you structure everything around the same paradigm. And everybody is aligned in a s more or less in the same way of programming. Then Speaking strictly of universal JavaScript, you have other advantages. If you are building a website and you are used to build single page application, you know one of the biggest problem is uh, uh, search engine optimization. Because uh, all your content might be indexed from Google, maybe not from other search engines, and maybe not all the page are indexed very well. Because Google says they can crawl pages with JavaScript, but few companies like Airbnb, they say, 
yeah, it doesn't always work. So if you're interested in that, it's very important that you start to adopt universal JavaScript. And also there is another advantage that is called for faster perceived load time, which means that the browser has already all the markup that, that it needs as soon as you load the page to render the content. So you will immediately start to see some content even before the JavaScript is loaded. So the user will have a perception that all your application is faster. There are other, other advantages, of course, and especially if you use React and some of the cool frameworks that are out these days. And the paradigm is that even if you build a static website, imagine, I don't know, a blog or something, if you can render everything from the server, you can pre-generate pages, but you are keeping the same experience of building application using components and all the good stuff that you are maybe using when writing code with React. And then there are other uh, very new optimization techniques like link prefetch that allows you to preload some pages. And if you are interested in this, there is a very recent talk from the React conference from Guillermo Rauch, and you have a link in there. So who is already using this technology? Netflix, probably one of the biggest users. They also created a number of courses and learning material and framework. Airbnb, WordPress, which for being a PHP company is kind of weird, but they're doing it as well, and Dropbox. So basically, if you go to their website and you open the debugger mode, you can see that the code gets rendered as soon as you load the page. So it's very interesting to go in this website and check how they are doing this. Okay, looks cool, but if you ever digged into this uh, kind of topic, everybody says, oh, it's very complicated, don't do that. It's not worth. So my goal today is to show why everybody says it's complicated and then to show you that it's not really that complicated and we can start and build something and then adapt as soon as it gets complex. So why is complicated? Well, because there are a, a number of problems that you need to face as soon as you start to think, oh, my code needs to work at the same time on the server and on the browser without changing that much. So the first thing you think, oh, okay, I'm used to write Node.js code and I write modules, then how should I bring this to the browser? And there are a number of tools and solutions around that, like you have a um, different way to build modules and you can use UMD as a uniform way to publish your modules. Then you have new tools like System.js but then at the end, what you want to have is combine all your modules together or into chunks that you can publish very easily to the browser. And to do that, you have tools like Browserify or Webpack. Then the second issue is, okay, I need to render whatever is happening on the browser, also on the server. So when I receive a request, the server needs to be aware of what goes in JavaScript and what builds my front-end application and needs also to be able to create the HTML code for that. So your application needs to render both on the browser and on the server, depending what's the life cycle of the request. And uh, this is quite new, and I think React was the first framework to introduce this thing directly in, the, in a web framework. But now Angular 2 Angular supports that as well, and we have alternatives like Next.js, but if you search online, there are really hundreds of frameworks these days. So another topic is the routing. As soon as you define the routing layer, we were used to do that in a single page application only in the browser part of the application. But if you want to render from the server, your server needs to be aware of the same routes. So how are we, go are we gonna share the routes configuration between browser and server? And to do that as well, we have other libraries and frameworks like React Router, Router 5, and Universal Router. So you start to see why it's complicated. There are so many choices. And still it's not over. We have universal data retrieval. Like I need to get data from a database or APIs or other external sources. How am I going to do that at the same, in the same way and needs to work both on the client and on the server? Again, we have a number of choices to solve this problem. It's not over. Universal state management. Okay, I want to keep my state consistent between browser and server. We have Redux, we have MobX, we have Cerebral, hundreds of tools there as well. So yeah, it's not over. We have languages, we have dialects, we have extensions. You know, JavaScript is a big mess at this stage. 
So that was more or less my feeling when I started to look into this topic. But yeah, at the same time, I want to be positive and show you that we can actually build something and it, that is not that art. So what are we gonna build? I already built a little application and you can find a tutorial online. There is a link in there that explains how to build um, universal JavaScript application using React and Express. And today we are gonna build an improved version of this using some new version of these uh, technologies. The application looks like this. So you have an index page with judo athletes and you can browse every page from every athlete. You can see their medals, their championship. So basically it's a very simple application where you have two different kinds of pages, an index page and a detailed page, and you can just browse back and forth and move to sections. Why this is cool? So basically it's a single page application, which means, okay, if I am in this page right now, I load everything that I need to render this page the first time, but then if I click somewhere to move to another section, I just load the two, the tr uh, three new resources that I need to render this page. And in this case, we just render three new images because the client already knows everything we need to render the next page. So this is very fast. You don't do much request to the server to move from one section to another. And if you move back to the previous section, you don't need to load anything because you already have everything you need. But we know that without universal rendering, if we do this, which is basically give me the HTML code of one of those pages, you will see just a template without much code. Instead with universal rendering, all the little things that you cannot really read there, it's the code, uh, it's the content of your page and Google can index that and your site can be searched for the terms that you have written in there. Okay, what are we gonna use to build our application? We are gonna use Webpack 2, React, React Router version four, which is pretty new and Express version five. So let's start. First thing, if you are using Yarn or even NPM is mostly the same, you need to download all the dependencies. So you can basically copy just this code. But what is important is to understand how are we gonna organize the application. So the first part is that we are gonna have a folder called components where we write all our React components as JavaScript files. Then we have, we are not gonna use at this stage a real database or a set of APIs. We are gonna keep things simple for now. So we just have a big JSON file that contains all the data that our application need. And then we have static resources, of course, which means our CSS, images, and the uh, JavaScript file that gets compiled by Webpack with all the resources, the JavaScript code that we need to run the application. Then we have an HTML template that we will see after in a moment. The client side part of our application, which basically we will see just a wrapper that launches our application in the browser. The server side, which is an express application. And then of course, bunch of configuration files and metadata. So the data set looks like this. So basically we have uh, a big array called athletes and Every athlete is an object where we have a number of properties like an ID, the name, the country, which is an object as well, and other data, like all the medals are linked to Wikipedia page. So you can imagine that if you had an API, this is the response that you will get for every athlete. Let's look at the React components. So the React components, I structured that in a specific way. There is no, actually no official rule. That's the way that works for me, and I think it's simple enough to understand. Basically, I generally have a layout component which defines the main structure of every page. In this case, it basically defines an either, a footer, and an empty space where we are gonna put every single page. Then we have the second layer, which is this concept of pages, so components that represent different pages. This is our index page. Then we have an example of an athlete page. So it, the two different views that we are gonna use in our application. And then there is another layer, which is helper, oh, also we have a 404 page. And then there is another layer of components, which are the ones that we will use in every page. So basically we are structuring our application in bigger components that can include smaller and smaller components. So that we can keep every single component simple and build them together. So one component is this athlete preview card. 
Another one is the menu. Then we can have little components like this flag helper, or we can view the single entry of the medals as another component. So it's not really important to understand how things are assembled, but it's important that you understand the concept that you build top down and you have smaller and smaller components assembled together. So just to give you an idea of if you never did React, how React works. So it's very close to writing HTML code. This is called JSX, which is basically a mashup between JavaScript and HTML. I know it sounds ugly, but yeah, works pretty well. So basically you define your parts of the component with HTML, like this part here defines our either. Then we have a generic section which defines the blank space where we will put every component representing a page. And then we have a footer, so very simple stuff. At the same way we can have, uh, this is our index page, where we say, okay, in order to render this index page, I just want that list of atlas that I need to display. So you see how every component is simple because it's basically just a poor function. You pass an input and you receive some HTML out of it. And basically, in this case, I am uh, iterating over every single athlete and saying, I want to use this specific component, which is athlete preview, to render every element in the input data. So in this way, we are reusing the smaller components. And just to give you an even closer look to how these JSX relate to actual HTML that you see in the browser, we can see this component here which is the athlete preview card that we defined before. So basically we have a link which translates to uh, an anchor tag, so a tag, that is the main container of our component. Then we have an image which represents actually the avatar, the face of the athlete. Then we have the name. Then we have the medal there with the count of the number of medals that this athlete won. So basically it's just writing. HTML code, and you can have references to variable with this curly brackets syntax. So you don't need to understand everything, of course, it's just to give you a generic idea on how React combines things together. Let's move to the routing layer. So basically we want to have two different routes, an index page, that's the one we will see when we go to the root of our application, and then we have the athlete page, which is identified by this prefix athlete and then you have slash some ID. So basically it will be the name of the athlete that we want to see. Okay, how do we build this? I'm using React 4, so React Router 4, so if you are used to the previous version it's a bit different, but actually I find this one much easier to understand. So basically what we want to do is we build all our application without any routing concept yet. So we have all our components. Now we want to say, okay, given some URLs, render this or something else. So we have this concept of switch, which, which means the first route that is matched is rendered in that specific part of the application. So it's like a big if block where we say render here whatever match the condition. So the first part that we want to check is our home. So if, we, if you go to slash, you will, you will use the function render index that we will see in a moment. If you go to athlete slash ID, you will render using render athlete. And otherwise, you will just use the component not found page to display the 404 page. So when we render the index, actually what we need to do is to say, okay, I want to render this specific component index page, and you have an opportunity to pass some specific data there. So in the first case, it's very simple because we just want to render all the athletes we have. In the second case, instead it's a bit more complex because you want to filter whatever is the athlete that is selected in that route. So here we need to put some logic, some business logic. And the logic is, okay, we find in the array. If we find an athlete, that's what we render. But if we don't find it, we want to render a not found page. So we create this level of abstraction where we say, my application is built, I have all the components I need, and then the routing is only in this single place where you define the rules that describes what to render in which page. Okay, let's see how the client application looks like. So in the browser, we still need to have some JavaScript that starts as soon as the page is loaded. 
and we write this JavaScript this way. So basically we import our application, which we already wrote in the previous file. So this is basically the core of our application, the application file. So we import this uh, application in our browser by just saying, okay, I want the application to be there, you see, app client, and I wrap this application in a router that is coming from the browser router object from the React router package, which basically means enable this application to be controlled from a level of routing that works for the browser. And this means, in other words, that you will use the history API and all other good stuff that we have in HTML5. And then at the end we just say, okay, as soon as the page is ready, we have everything we need, render this uh, code inside a specific element in our HTML, which is the element called main. So again, here you have the browser router. Here you have our, we, we are actually wrapping the application with this browser router. And then we say, render this application inside main. So let's look at this HTML template, which basically is just adding a head tag and a body tag. Inside the head, we have all the metadata that we want to have to, to render our page. And then we have here in this uh, div, just a template that will contain the code that we will render from the server after. So at this stage, you can, you can assume that markup tag there is always empty because the browser will do everything. But this will come handy for later. And then as well, we have also the script tag, which is our bundle file. So let's see how we, how, how we can create this bundle file. So we said we are gonna use Babel and Webpack, and basically the configuration looks like that. In Babel, we just say, okay, we want to use React and, and uh, ExmaScript 2015, so we use two very standard presets. And then in the case of Webpack, we want to say, okay, uh, we need to have a way to identify all the components that we are using in our app. So what Webpack does, we specify an entry file, and Webpack reads all the imports in every file, so it builds actually like a tree starting from this file, and understands all the dependency that you need to run your application. Then we say, for every of the files you find, you need to follow some rules, and basically it means the rules are use Babel to transpile everything to a version of JavaScript that the browser can understand, and then squeeze everything together into a single file, which is gonna be saved in bundle.js. And to build this, you just need to run Webpack on the command line, and you will see the file gets created in bundle.js. One last thing before we can run our application, our first version of the application is that we want to have a little server just to expose those files through the HTTP layer. And basically we are gonna use Express just, it's gonna come just because it's gonna come in handy later when we want to add the universal routing rendering part. So we use the template that we saw before, so we need to say we want to use AJS as a template engine. Then we say expose every static file, which means CSS, images, and other static files using whatever is in the static folder. And then we say, whatever is the request, it doesn't matter actually that we match a specific path, given that the routing at this stage is only on the client side, render the index without any markup. So we will see how to change this function later to have also universal rendering. So do you want to see how this works? So this is the first version of our application, which basically means the first time that we load this page, we start to load some assets. And then as soon as we click, we don't need to load anything else because the browser already have everything we need. So just to see it better again. So as soon as we refresh everything, we load everything we need. But then when you move to a new page, you just keep loading the new images. You don't need to do other server requests. But with this version of the application, we don't have universal rendering yet, so there is a problem. What if I want to see the source code of this page? So I can say view page source, and, oh sorry, this one is cached. If I do this, okay. So this is actually what we have, which means you don't have anything. So if a search engine or another tool from Facebook or 
whatever other search engine goes there, they don't know what's in your page. So nothing gets indexed in there. And also there is another subtle issue that sometimes is important to manage. What if I go to a 404 page, like I write here, I don't know, test, which doesn't match to anything. I have a 404 page, which is good, but if you look closer here, the status code is 200, which means that, again, if a search engine is going to this page, it's gonna believe that this is actual content that you want to display. So this can be another subtle but very important problem that we are gonna solve with universal rendering. So going back here, how are we gonna add actually universal rendering and routing? And before doing that, I want to recap to what we did so far. Basically, we defined the views, combining different React components with different responsibilities. Then we added a very simple layer of routing that so far works only on the browser side using React Router. We compiled everything using Babel and Webpack. And finally, we ran our application using a very simple Express server. Okay, let's add now server-side rendering and routing. So we just need to update our server app. Believe me or not, that's the only change we need to do so far to enable universal JavaScript. And basically what we want to do is to import new components in our server.js. And these components comes again from the React and React Router packages. Plus we want to import our React component application. So the main application that we defined at the very beginning. So then what we need to do is to say in this piece of logic that can render any page, we want to actually write some custom logic. And the custom logic is, okay, I want to render some HTML markup, a very specific one depending on the route that is matched by the browser. But in order to do that, we just need to use the static router component and wrap our application. So you saw that in our client application, we were wrapping using a browser router. Here we are wrapping using a static router. So that's the only difference we need to have between front end and back end. And then there is another, another little piece of code that we can use in order to return the proper status code. So for example, we have a redirect. So if the route is actually a redirect route, we can manage this in the proper way on the HTTP layer. And as well, if the page that we are rendering is a 404, we can retard the proper status code. <laughs> so let's test this again. So, so again, when we load, sorry, let's do it. When we load every, the first page, we have everything we need to render this page. Then we move to another page and we just load the images so we have exactly the same experience that we had before. But now, assuming that I am a search engine and I want to see the source code of this page, I go here and you see I have already much more code here. And this code is rendered by React on the server side and it contains everything that we can see in our page. So actually Google or any other search engine can see what's in our page and index it. Plus, if we go again to this test page, which doesn't exist, we get 404, but this time we get a proper, sorry, we get a proper status code here. So actually, now we have a consistent experience from what is expected from any HTTP application. So to recap again what we did, first we created a single page application using React Router, and most of the concepts that you probably already know if you ever did any React development. Then we basically added server-side routing and rendering with, I don't know, 10 lines of code, probably even less, just in our server.js file. And that's it, we have a universal JavaScript application. So this was a very simple example. So there is, of course, more you can do from that, if you, especially if you are building a real application. And the concerns there are, okay, I will need to get data from a real source, not a JSON file. So I will need to have what is called universal data retrieval. And to do that, you can use API proxy or something called async props. And there is a complete chapter in the book I showed you at the beginning if you are interested in going there, but also you can find hundreds of tutorial online. 
And also another big concern is how to manage the state in a consistent way between the server and the browser, and there you can use Redux. All the code that you saw is available on GitHub at this link here, so you can go there and check it. I'm gonna add some examples about Redux and uh, universal data retrieval probably later. So that's basically it. Thank you everybody. <laughs>